Well, this morning, uh, our, our passage of Scripture, it, it's perhaps a little bit more substantial than the ones we've been looking at, but um, it shouldn't take any longer to, uh, or at least much longer to deal with it. But we're going to look at Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, and let me begin by, by reading it. Now, one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. A moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins. And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Well, may the Lord bless uh, this, this account uh, to our understanding and uh, to be helpful to us, uh, to help us to examine ourselves perhaps a bit more and learn perhaps something of how great our debt is uh, to the Lord and how much then we should love him. Now, last week, remember, Jesus reminded us who John, uh, John the Baptist, really is. He is the one God sent in the spirit and power of that great prophet, Elijah, to warn those Jews who had become, you might say, comfortable with with their sins. You know, sometimes we can be comfortable with our sins to the point where, you know, they, they make their home in us, and we don't seem to notice them any longer. Um, and we don't seem to be too concerned about them any longer. Uh, and that one day we actually have to stand before the Lord to give an account for our lives. Well, that's the complacency that the Jews had fallen into. So God raised up this prophet to send, them, uh, send him to them to make them uncomfortable. You know, to make them, uh, to convict them of their sins. Now, this is something we rarely see in, in, in the church today. And uh, I was just uh, commenting recently as Don and I were talking about this, but we seldom see it in, in the more contemporary, you know, Christian songs we see. We, we see songs of love to the Lord and songs of love, His love for us, but uh, everything is so focused on that love that we really don't hear too much about how we are to love Him. That we are to love Him, but it's just basically our emotions, our, our affections, But these need to work themselves out in our lives. This hadn't happened in the Jewish people, and John was sent there to point that out to them. And he was sent so that they might wake up and they might listen to God and that they might know not only that his judgment is real, but as you read what John the Baptist preached, that it's coming. And you need to get ready for it. It's coming as certainly as the fact you're going to die You know, that judgment is coming, and if you aren't ready for it, you're going to be destroyed by it. So he was sent to wake them up, but he was also sent out to give them hope, to remind them of God's promise to save them, and that that was about to be fulfilled. 
Messiah was coming. That was the purpose of John. That's why he was not just a prophet, but he was greater than a prophet because he was the one the Lord sent to announce the coming of the Messiah, the one who could take away their sins, and the only one. And again, you need to listen. He's the only one who can save us from judgment, and they needed to know that. But again, we were reminded that there were two responses to John's message. Those who basically um, didn't, well, I should say those who believed, first of all, who knew that they hadn't done well with their lives, that uh, things aren't going to go well for them on that day, they turned from their sins. They submitted to John's baptism. They began looking for the Messiah who was coming, but there were also those who didn't believe. And, you know, the gospel always has two effects, right? There are those people who listen. There are those people who don't listen. Well, there were those who didn't listen to what John had to say. They thought they were just fine the way they were. God was going to accept them. They had good things they had done. Their good, we, their good deeds were going to outweigh their, their bad deeds. They were related to Abraham. They were God's children. They had church membership, so they were going to make it on that day. These were the scribes and the Pharisees and a majority of the Jewish people. And they did not then repent, they weren't baptized, and they really set themselves against the Messiah if someone should actually appear and claim to be him. Well, Jesus finished his, his discussion there by saying this, wisdom is vindicated by her children, by which he means that uh, true wisdom is shown by the results uh, of the choices that wisdom makes. If we are truly wise, we will listen to what God says as He speaks to us through the gospel. We'll turn from our sins. We'll trust Jesus to make us right with God, and we will be ready for that day. But if we're foolish, if our hearts have not been changed by God's grace, like that of the scribes and Pharisees, and we continue to think we're good enough and that we don't need to listen to God, we're still going to have to stand before the Lord. But on that day, we will be destroyed. Now, this morning, our Lord tells us how we can know that we will be safe on that day of judgment because you realize that the people who, sub who basically turned from their sins, submitted to John's baptism, and waited for the Messiah, many of them actually followed Jesus, but in the end, they all fell away because that wasn't enough. There had to be more. And we see in this example what that more is, how we can know that we have more than just and historic faith. We believe these things actually took place. And that boils down to, of course, the fact that we love Him, that we are trusting Him with a loving trust. But He goes even further than that. He also tells us how we can have an even stronger assurance that we belong to the Lord, and that is by having, of course, a love that produces more works, a stronger kind of love, because to the degree we love the Lord, to that degree, we are going to minister to Him. We are going to serve Him. Now, this morning, we're going to look at three things. First of all, two very different individuals, as, as you know from what I've already read. Their different responses to Jesus and then what Jesus has to say about them. Now, first of all, we see two very different individuals, a Pharisee and a, a woman who is a sinner. Now, the first one is Simon, the Pharisee. And we've already reviewed a little bit about Pharisees, but I thought maybe we could just look at a few more things about them. The Pharisees, as we were reminded last time, they were the religious leaders of Israel. You know, they were essentially the pastors of Israel, the shepherds of Israel, those whom the Lord appointed to lead His people in the truth, to teach them, and to be living examples of what the Lord calls them to do, what that looks like in actual practice. Essentially, they were to the Old Testament church what, what elders are to be to the New Testament church. Now, God appoints these leaders. He appoints these examples and these teachers in the church because obviously the Lord wants us to live in a particular way. He wants us to live in a holy way. And so he appoints teachers to, to do this work, to, to lead by example so that we'll all be encouraged to do the same thing. Now, one thing we need to realize is that nobody is perfect except for the Lord, right? The only one who has ever succeeded in doing all that the Lord calls us to do perfectly is Jesus. And you know why? It's because 
you know, apropos our, our, our you know, theme this morning. He is the only one who has loved his father with all of his heart. He wasn't divided between, you know, the, the father and the world. He loved his father with his whole heart. And his father uh, was the only thing on his mind and heart as he went out to minister that he might honor and please him in everything he did. That's the reason why Jesus lived the way he lived and did what he did. And that's the, also the reason why we need to trust Jesus in order to save us because he is the only one who has ever done everything that the Lord requires. He did not fail even in the slightest point. He is the only one the Father will accept. And when we trust in Jesus, we are, as it were, placed in Jesus. We are clothed with Jesus. When the Father looks at us, he sees Jesus. And that's the reason why he can accept us. But that's also why we need to follow the example of Jesus, right? Because he's the only one who did it exactly in the way it should be done. He's the one who has loved. And again, he kept the commandments. That's how you love God. Now, even though that is true, there is still a sense in which, again, God appoints leaders in the church uh, to, to follow, that we need to follow those who are following Jesus, not just the leaders of the church, but wherever we find those examples. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, be imitators of me. Be imitators of me, he's saying. You know, be imitators of Paul. But he goes on to say, just as I also am of Christ. So as, you, as we see Paul following Jesus and giving us an example of Jesus, we need to follow that example. And so we can look for examples to follow. That's one of the reasons why church history is, is, um, is, is so important and so good because there are so many in the history of the church who were used powerfully by the Lord who loved him and gave themselves to him and weren't willing to compromise with the world. And I'll tell you what, those were the only ones who did anything worthwhile, okay? The ones who loved and served the Lord. There are a lot of people who have accomplished a lot of great things in the world who were not believers, but when this world is destroyed and everything turns into dust, as we're reminded, even crowns turn into dust eventually, it's going to mean nothing in the end. The only thing that matters is what we've done for the Lord. So we need to be encouraged by examples like that. But getting back now to these Pharisees, they were to be those examples. But they had a big problem. They were self-righteous hypocrites, right? Now that may not have been the case with all of them. There may have been some of them that were actually seeking after the truth, who actually were trying to be faithful to God and were looking for the fulfillment of God's promises. Maybe Nicodemus. Remember Nicodemus was... A Pharisee who came out and talked to Jesus and he says, we believe that you have come from God as a teacher for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Seems like there was something about Nicodemus and we see after the crucifixion, Nicodemus went with Joseph of Arimathea to prepare the body of Jesus for burial. Nicodemus appears to be a true believer, but he, he noticed he says in that passage, I just quoted in John 3, 1, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, which means there were others among the Pharisees. So it's not all the Pharisees, but for the most part, they were a self-righteous lot, a group of hypocrites who thought they were holy, when as a matter of fact, they were the most unholy, and that the common people were unclean. And so they, they separated themselves and, and actually as people would walk by who, who they didn't think were good enough, they'd pull in the skirts of their robes so they wouldn't touch them and become unclean. So they didn't realize they were unclean and they shouldn't touch the others. They might soil them, okay? And well, the point is, Simon was no exception. This is the kind of person he was, self-righteous, hypocrite. Now, the other individual is this woman. Now, there have been attempts to try to identify her perhaps with the other woman who does essentially the same thing. Uh, we might sort of assume that because of the alabaster box of perfume, but really, alabaster was a very common vessel used to hold perfume. Uh, we don't know that it's not the same circumstances in which we find the other woman anointing Jesus specifically for his burial, okay? So we really don't know who this woman was, but we do know something about her. We knew what she did for a living. Luke says she was a sinner. Well, everybody's a sinner. How does that how does that separate her from the rest of, of really mankind and the Jews in Jerusalem? Well, A.T. Robertson, who is a Greek scholar, 
wrote the largest, again, the largest grammar ever written on the Greek language, tells us that the phrasing means that she was a woman of the town, a sinner in the city, one who was devoted to sin, someone who was known to be so. In other words, he says, she was a prostitute. She was a harlot. But I want you to notice from the account we have here, she had repented of her harlotry. Now, we've already read what she did to show her love for Jesus, which means that she had already trusted him. Even as she's coming to Simon's house, I mean, why is she coming there? She's coming to minister to him. Why is she coming to do that? So she can earn his forgiveness? No, it's because she has already been forgiven. Her love was the evidence, okay? So she was a harlot, but she had already trusted in Jesus, and she wanted to show her love to Jesus. But I want you to notice something else, that even though her life now, as, as we see how she responds to Jesus, showed that she was deeply sorrowful, that she regretted how she had lived and she had turned to Jesus, as far as Simon was concerned, her reputation still clung to her. You know, she still, in his eyes, was, was a harlot. Now, there's a very important lesson, I think, for us here. And that is we should never forget that when the Lord forgives us for our sins, He no longer identifies us with those sins. Let me read a passage of Scripture that tells us that quite plainly. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, Paul writes this, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And what he means is those who are doing these things, that they're practicing sin, not repenting, not trusting Jesus, they're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But he says this, such were some of you, but you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Such were some of you, but you are no longer. Because you've repented, you've trusted in Jesus, you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified. He uh, further writes in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and you're in Christ by trusting in Jesus Christ, that's how you know you're in Him and you love Him, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now the point is, if God doesn't see us in the light of our sins anymore, once we've trusted in Jesus and been cleansed, then we should not see ourselves in that light and we should not really be concerned if other people, like this Pharisee looking at this woman, sees us in this light, and we should not look at other people in that light. If they've trusted Jesus, then they are new, and we are new, and we need to apply that and live that, okay? So, again, we see these two individuals. Now, secondly, we see that both this Pharisee and this woman responded to Jesus in a very different way. Simon invited Jesus to dine with him. You know, from the end of the passage, we see there were other people there. This Pharisee had invited other people also to join him. They were most likely his fellow Pharisees. And notice Jesus, he knew what the Pharisees were like. But he went, he went graciously because he was willing to serve wherever his father opened a door. He knew it wasn't going to be easy. <laughs> he knew that he was going into enemy territory, into the den, as it were, meeting with enemies, meeting with people who were going to accuse him. But, but he did it anyway. He did it for the glory of his father, and he did it for the good of this Pharisee. By the way, here's another example that we can follow. You know, we don't just go to those people we think are going to receive Jesus. We have to go to the people we also think aren't going to receive Jesus because we never know. We don't know what the Lord or who the Lord might call to himself. Now, when he arrived, Simon began by slighting him. He didn't show him any of those common courtesies. He would have shown his, his other guests, 
uh, he provided no water to wash Jesus' feet. That's something you would commonly do. If somebody came into your house, people are walking around in sandals on, on dirt roads, their feet are dirty. So one of the common courtesies is here's some water you can wash your feet with. They would also greet one another with a kiss of, of greeting. You know, how that kiss was applied may be speculative, but we know there was a kiss that was involved. He received or gave him no customary uh, kiss. And then something that we have a hard time understanding, no oil to anoint his head. You know, we, we don't like oil in our hair, but in those days, that was a, a sign of, of love and affection and greeting, and it was a common courtesy that was extended to guests. Undoubtedly, Simon would have shown these, these, you know, these common courtesies to his other guests, but when Jesus arrives, you know, there's, there's nothing, okay? So in other words, Jesus wasn't welcome. He, he invited him, but he wasn't really welcome. And you know, neither was the woman, which he made quite clear by what he says about her under his breath. If this man knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't even allow her to touch him. And of course, the fact that Jesus allowed her to, to touch him and to show his, her affection towards him in this way, Simon despised Jesus even more. So here we have this guy who doesn't welcome Jesus, despises this woman, and then despises Jesus for allowing her to minister to him. That was his response. Okay, but what about the woman? Well, notice she came to Simon's house only because she knew Jesus would be there and she wanted to show him just how much uh, he meant to her. And she was willing to go into this den of Pharisees knowing the hatred and the contempt the Pharisee or the Pharisees would show her and she wasn't disappointed. They did, you know, she was contemptible in their eyes. She came with something that was very precious to her, this alabaster vial of perfume, in order to anoint Jesus. She stood behind him, overcome by the mercy that she had received from him. And as she was crying these tears of joy and they were falling on his feet, she was wiping them with her hair, kissing his feet, and anointing them with perfume. So what Simon refused to do because of his disdain for Jesus, this woman did for him because of her love. And we need to recognize, as Jesus does, this was a love that can only come from a heart that has been transformed by the grace of God because people who come into this world as we came into this world, we don't come into the world loving God. We wouldn't go and, and kiss the feet of Jesus. We, we would be those crying out for his crucifixion. That's how we are when we come into the world, but that's not what she's doing. What she's doing is showing love, and that's because her heart has been changed. So what is it that Jesus wanted Simon to learn from this? And what does he want us to learn from this? Well, he tells us in verses 42 through 43 and actually through the rest of, the, uh, of this section, but let me just read this. Jesus said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. A moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. Remember this, one denarii is a day's wage, so 500 days' wages and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Now he goes on to say this, and this is the point of this account and what our Lord wants us to learn. The one who is forgiven much loves much. The one who is forgiven little loves little, and though Jesus doesn't say it, it's certainly implied here, the one who isn't forgiven doesn't love at all. Now, I think that fits the case of the Pharisee. He didn't love Jesus at all. Jesus has the power to forgive sins, and those whom he forgives love him. Now, that is how we can know that we have trusted Jesus and that we have more than just this historic faith that many of the Jews had, but in the end, abandoned Jesus. It is that we love him. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know that from, from this, but we also have it a little bit more specifically painted in Galatians 5, 6, where Paul writes this, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, and again, that's the Old Testament sign, means anything, but faith working through love, a faith that works by love. What Paul is saying here, it, it really doesn't matter whether we have the outward sign of the covenant, 
By the way, the, the sign of circumcision, the removal of the foreskin of the flesh um, you know, from the male procreative organ was simply meant to represent the circumcision of the heart where the Lord removes the stoniness of the heart and gives us a heart of flesh, a heart that beats for the Lord. Okay? That's what it represents. And what he's saying is it doesn't matter whether you have that sign. Okay? Whether it's the Old Testament sign of circumcision or that corresponding New Testament sign of baptism, which really represents the same thing as, as the circumcision only in a non bloody way, the washing of water, uh, which is symbolized the washing away of our sins by the application of Christ by the Holy Spirit to us. It doesn't matter whether we're circumcised or baptized. What matters is whether we actually have what those things represent, the new heart, the new birth, whether we've been washed by the, the, the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Well, how can we know that? Paul says, if we have a faith that works through love. A faith that not only believes that Jesus is the Lord and the Savior, but one that lovingly receives Him as Lord and Savior. Well, how can we know whether we actually have lovingly received Him? We can only know it by how we actually live. Remember what James writes in James 2.26, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith is without works is dead. And what he means by works here are good works, works according to the word of God. Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, if, if that's what you think is true, you will keep my commandments. You see, because that's what it means to love him, is to obey the law of love. If we love Jesus, we will keep his commandments. So what what, what, he, what he's saying here is this, if we are willing to obey him, if we're willing to own Jesus as our Lord and our Savior and serve him, not only when it's easy to do that, like in front of other people who are also confessing Jesus, because we applaud one another for the things we do for Jesus, but even in front of those who hate Jesus. Do you know this woman came and displayed her love for Jesus in front of her enemies, people who hated her the most, these religious hypocrites, these Pharisees, but she was willing to do it. If we are willing to show our love to Jesus, even in the face of our enemies, then we, you know what? We really do love Jesus. But if we refuse to show him, even the affection we would show our friends, even the common courtesies, as these Pharisees, well, as this Pharisee did, and, and you know, very likely the others would as well, then we are still far from him. We still need him. We still need to trust in him. What we have is an empty faith. What we have is an historic faith, not a true faith, because when the Lord saves, he transforms the life from the inside out, not, not through the external pressure of, of the ministry of the church, but through, you know, inwardly through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's why he gives us the Holy Spirit and why the Spirit gives us love so that we will be transformed. But one last thing, let's also remember that it's one thing to love Jesus. It's another thing to love him to the degree that we actually should love him. Remember Jesus said the one who is forgiven much, loves much. Well, how much has the Lord forgiven us, right? How much has he taken away of our sins? Unless we realize just how great we're indebted to his mercy then we're not going to love him as, as we really should. Now, I think oftentimes we, we may sort of deceive ourselves into thinking, I, you know, I only fell a little bit short. So, you know, if I only think I've been forgiven that much, my love for him is not going to be much, you know, greater than that, probably not even going to live up to that. But, you know, as we, as we live in the church, as we, as we learn more from the Word of God, as we sort of learn more about ourselves, if the Spirit of God is working in us, eventually he will bring us to see ourselves as we really are like he did with the Apostle Paul, who wrote at the end of his life, it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And he didn't then follow that up by saying, among whom I am you know, the least sinner. I was close to perfect. I was better than all my contemporaries. I was keeping the law of God. I mean, we, we see what, what he thought of that in Philippians chapter 3. But rather, he says, among whom I am foremost of all. I am the greatest of sinners. Um, as we 
grow in our relationship with the Lord and we see ourselves against the standard of perfection as we measure ourselves against Jesus, we see that we fall much shorter than we thought we did originally. And God has had a tremendous amount of mercy upon us. As a matter of fact, He has forgiven us a debt that an eternity of suffering in hell could never pay. That's the reason why hell goes on forever. The Lord has shown us infinite mercy. And so we need to show Him love in return. So we need to look to Him for that grace to do it. And we, we can never measure up to that. It's not that we're ever going to measure up to it, but we need to realize we have never shown as much love as we should. So may the Lord give us the grace to reflect uh, that or give us, the, give us the grace, the help we need to reflect our gratitude to Him in the way that we live. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, um, let's not only ask that the Lord would apply this, but let's also at the same time pray that He would prepare us to come to the table.